Hi everyone, my name is Jerry, and I am the director and curator of the very small Fishing Museum and Cultural Center out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, this video is dedicated to the brand new community, Historical Fishing, especially on Facebook, uh, because it is fantastic to see so many dedicated living historians and reenactors focused on fishing, uh, which is such an important aspect of our community and culture. And we had a request from that community to share how to restore fishing creels. So before we get started, we need to answer the question, what is a fishing creel? Because there's plenty of people who aren't aware of that. We have a few examples from our collection here on the wall behind me. Uh, none too especially rare or unique, um, but I will show you some of the examples. A fishing creel is a usually wicker uh, basket-like device with a flat back and a rounded front and a hole on the lid uh, that fishermen basically from the 1500s through the early 1900s uh, would use as a sort of, the official use was to hold your fly fishing catches, uh, usually trout, and put it into, put the catch into the hole in the top, so you'd have a box full of fresh fish uh, when you return back. However, a lot of fishermen would use these as a sort of makeshift tackle, tackle box uh, as well, when you can, you can see a few examples of that too. Um, so it's kind of a fusion of uh, the official use is to hold the fish, uh, but it's kind of wound up being a general all around can't hold everything. In fact, there are a few examples of double level uh, creels with a lower level for holding your tackle and an upper level for holding the fish or the other way around. So, the f so this video is all about how to find an antique or how to once you have found an antique creel how to do basic, absolute basic, restoration on it. So, the first question, the first step that you need to do is ask yourself, as a historian, should I restore this creel? And the answer usually will be, yeah, it's fine. And that's because most of the creels uh, that we have surviving today are fairly, um, I don't wanna say unimportant, but they're fairly modern and fairly basic and these came around the most of them that we have came around in the era of mass production and so they're not beautiful intricate works of art most of them do have some sort of artistry on it we have this beautiful example likely from the late 1800s uh that had this just cute little four four part diamond shaped decor decoration on the top of it neat stuff um and there wasn't really too much more to it than that you can see a couple holes here for a strap to go across your shoulder. The last example that I showed you earlier has this little peg on top for holding it uh, closed with a little loop here to stick the peg in. Both of these are held together with what looks to be makeshift cord uh, as a hinge and one of them even has a nail, this one here, as a makeshift like repair for it. Uh, so it's neat, it's got some cool history to it. I have this, and these two were restored by us. They came to us in pretty nasty condition. This is one that I'm not sure if I'm going to restore. I love it, it's beautiful. Uh, it does not have a flat back, but more of an ergonomic back, which I think is pretty neat. So it would have been held almost leaning forward on your body like this, rather than flat like this. Um, not sure if I'm gonna restore it uh, because it's unique, but especially because of the coloration on it. I'm not sure what it is, uh, so, before I restore it, I want to make sure of if I should restore it. Uh, and that's the two-part answer to the question, should I restore my creel? Uh, one, if it looks a bit unusual, uh, if, for example, in an artistic way, or in this case, a, a different color, maybe as a different uh, a stain to it, you should look into that before you attempt your own amateur restoration of the creel. One of the big giveaways of a creel about whether or not you should restore it is the location, or is the age, is the age. And one of the not guaranteed, but easiest ways to tell the age of a creel is the location of the hole. Uh, if the hole is off to one side or the other, uh, which it usually is, if you're looking at it, it's gonna be on the left side, and that's because you hold the creel on the left side of your body, 
so that as you put the fish in, the hole is towards the front. Uh, that came about in the, usually the late 1800s. If you have a creel with a hole in the center, it is likely, but not guaranteed, going to be from an earlier time. And if your creel is older than maybe 100 years or so, uh, you really shouldn't restore it for use. That probably belongs in a museum, and you can probably find a cheaper, more sturdy, and uh, more recent creel of the same or similar construction that you can use in your historical fishing. But today, we are going to be restoring this beautiful, giant creel. I mean, look at the size of, I'm gonna hold it back here compared to one of these little guys that I showed you earlier. This is just a giant creel. Someone was hoping to get real lucky on their fishing excursion. And you can see that the hole is off to one side over the other. And I would argue that this particular example is right on the boundary between should I or shouldn't I uh, restore it. Because it does have this beautiful decorative stripe in the middle. Uh, and in fact, if you can look on the back, you'll see that it has interwoven colors on the back. Um, the other thing that you'll notice is the trim around the lids, or around the lid and then the mouth of the bottom part, is twisted uh, reed, which is beautiful compared to the other ones, which just have a solid reed. So this is an especially beautiful example, and to be honest, I would not be using this for reenacting, but I am going to restore it in the same way that I would restore one for use, because I do want to display this and a little bit of restoration, uh, or in this case, a little bit of preservation, uh, will we'll go, we'll go the extra mile to prevent it from being damaged on your excursion. So, let's head over to the workshop and see what we can do with this for step two. All right, now that you've passed step one and you've determined that you do indeed want to preserve and restore your fishing creel, we are on to step two. Two. Now these steps from, or this one from step two, is something that I picked up from the preservation of antique fencing masks, which uh, you might be aware are also made of wicker or sometimes with uh, wire mesh as well. Similar concepts and fencing masks, just like fishing creels, will pick up a lot of dust because they have a lot of these small crevices in them. And so, the first thing that I do is I will take a paintbrush, an untouched, unused paintbrush, uh, and just brush over the entire item gently. You don't want to pick off, you don't want to whack at it, you just want to brush it off to make sure that the dust can get loosened up and removed before we continue on to step three. During this process, you're going to see a lot of imperfections, likely, uh, with your creel. So, for example, I've got a couple of beautiful examples right here, completely different steps. The first one is this loose strand here. Now, if you are going to restore it for use, you could feel free to clip that off because we don't want it getting snagged or tugged on or anything uh, like that. But it's not necessary. It will fall off if it needs to. Another issue that you might find is imperfections in the coloration. It's not showing up too well on the camera, but you can see a little bit of these white splotches. Don't worry about that right now. You will be able to get those cleaned up if it doesn't get cleaned up in step four. Don't forget to get the inside of your creel also. There's a lot of dust built up in there, so be able to hold it upside down uh, or place it upside down on a stand while you do your dusting in there so that the dust can fall out. As much as possible, it's not going to be perfect. Give it a couple brushes over two or three times with your light paintbrush, uh, preferably with natural hair, I forgot to mention that earlier, uh, in order to loosen up and remove as much dust as possible. And one more thing for step two before you move on, I have frequently found, if these have been staying in a shed or basement or something, you'll find these gross little, uh, like, spider web or egg sacs or something just kind of shoved into the into little nooks and crannies here. So you are going to want to grab a pick of whatever variety, uh, as long as it's small, and you'll be able to go in there and just remove as much of that as possible. You'll, as in this case, you'll notice a bunch of dead bugs in there. Here, I'll get a close-up shot. 
And it looks like there's actually quite a few of these. Uh, and you see I'm going pretty gently and the webbing likes to stick to itself. Looks like there's quite a few of these on this particular example, so this might take me some time. Be careful not to scrape the wicker. Or at least not too harshly. Oh, gross, 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 gross. Looks like there's some bait in here, boys. All right, I have picked off as much of that gross old spider webbing as I could find. Uh, given it one more brush over, and every single time I look at it, I find more dust on it, so that's going to happen. Uh, but now it is time to move on to step three. And now that you've removed all the dust and particles from the outside of your, or at least as much as you can from the outside of your creel, you'll see that there's still some big chunks, like I've got this unknown yellow substance right here. I have found that that's better to work off either during or after step three. And that's what we're on right now, step three. So you can actually reuse the paintbrush that you used for step two in this step, uh, as long as you don't use it in the future for more dusting. Because we are going to be applying a light layer of mineral oil. Mineral oil is what I personally use. A lot of people will subscribe to other types of oil, tongue oil or linseed oil. Um, linseed oil is widely regarded as the most historically accurate, but it's kind of like this generic plastering of like, yeah, linseed oil, it's from history, and it doesn't really apply to the era, if you will. Um, I think if you're going for a late 1800s impression, you could probably have access to quite a few bits of oil, even in the 1700s too. Uh, but 1600s and earlier, you would want to use linseed oil due to the popularity of flax before, or, or linen as a cotton. You'd have a lot of byproducts like uh, linseed oil. Uh, but for now, I'm using mineral oil, and for those of you out there who are thrifty, this is actually very, very easy to acquire. Uh, you can go to any pharmacy from any store, go to the stomach section, and you can pick up a bottle of 100% mineral oil in the stomach section because this is a diuretic. So don't chug this as you're, uh, as you're cleaning up. But I also like it because it, uh, as a non-food byproduct oil, it isn't going to get any mold uh, growth on it, which I've seen with a few other types of like olive oil, if people use olive oil. Uh, not saying that happens all the time, just my own personal experiences. So affordable, readily available, and uh, appropriate. So let's do this. My personal concerns uh, for this particular step with this particular example is, like you saw earlier, this has the dark interwoven reeds, uh, but this is only visible on the back. If you look to the front or the sides, I don't know if it's because it got a lot of sunlight or what, but the darkness on those particular reeds has been removed. Uh, it's not there anymore. So what I'm hoping for is that uh, like it would with wood, and oil might bring that differentiation back. If it doesn't, this particular restoration project might have some additional steps, which I would not include in this video because this is just basic restoration. We might do more with more advanced stuff later on. But for now, we'll see how the oil goes. You really never know when it comes to these decorative things. Um, and it depends on how the original uh, creator of it decided to integrate those different colors. Remember, if your creel is extra artistic and it looks like the creator went the extra mile to make it a work of art in addition to a tool, uh, I might recommend not restoring it in this basic way. Remember, this is just for simple creels for reviving them for use. So for, to, for this step, I'm going to be using the lid of a Tupperware container as a holder for the oil as I pour it into that and then I'll dip my paintbrush in there and apply it and let's see how it looks. So one of the unique things about this step, as you saw in the last one, is trying to figure out whether the oil is going to clean up some of the imperfections. I have no idea what this yellow stuff is, so let us apply some of the mineral oil and see what happens. You can see it right there. Oh, 
All right, so it is not as chunky, and I obviously just give it a quick little layer. It's not as chunky as it was because it sort of liquefied a bit. Take my thumb and do a little bit of a scratch there. Ew, it certainly is something. So what I would recommend there is to take a rag or even a piece of paper towel once you get it wet with the oil and try to gently, as you should always do with artifacts, even after you're finished, try to remove it. So let's see how that works with a bit of paper towel. And does not look like it's focusing where I want it to, so we'll just get lucky. Or you'll use your imagination. Ugh. So that's definitely something. I definitely want that removed uh, just to make sure it does not make an eyesore or stand out. So keep giving it a good gentle rubbing until it is removed after you have gotten it wet with the oil. Hey guys, so uh, as you are oiling your creel, uh, just a reminder that you do indeed want to oil the inside as well as the outside. One of the benefits of mineral oil, I forgot to say earlier, is because it is digestible, uh, you're not gonna worry about getting any poisons or chemicals uh, that some non-traditional or non-natural finishes would might might add to any fish that you put in here. Ah. Uh, one thing that does happen with reed when it dries out over time is it gets a little bit rigid. It gets a little bit uh, almost tight, which is why this lid is having some difficulty raising up. So as you are oiling, make sure you get any moving or, I guess, uh, hinges sections that may or may not be made out of uh, reed because it'll loosen them up a little bit more and allow you to open and close your reel, your creel a little bit easier. Be, be smart when you do that and make sure it actually is the same material and you wouldn't actually be damaging it rather than hurt, rather than helping it. I'm gonna finish this up and then uh, we'll move on to step four, which is the easiest. So I'll see you there. All right, gang, we are all finished with step three. Um, as you'll note, especially as you go on, that this your creel will have a wet look to it right now, more shiny, uh, which is normal because step four is going to be letting it dry. It's the easiest part of this whole process. Um, couple, couple notes I wanted to show you as we are going on. My original hope that the blackened or darkened uh, reeds that you can see in the back would reappear in the front is dashed. So with this particular piece, I might look into other ways of bringing that back uh, to the way it was before, but uh, everything else seems to look just fine. Now, if you do have a bunch of those little strands sticking out, I might recommend a couple clippers. I don't have any down here, so I'm just gonna let it sit until maybe after it's dried. Um, but this might also be a good time to fill in the time and do a little bit of preening on your creel. So I'm gonna bring this upstairs, let it get some, uh, not fresh air, it's still winter outside, but I will let it dry out, and then I will catch you guys uh, after it's been dried for a little bit. You, you will wanna let it sit overnight. I'm probably just gonna record this video tonight, so it might still be a little wet then, but I'll see you there. All right, and here we are. It's only been about an hour and a half since I put the oil on, but it's already starting to dry out, and. The uh, color is going to lighten up over time as well, but it just looks gorgeous. Um, and even on the back, you can still see the color differentiation is still right there. And honestly, my little phone camera does not do it justice. It still looks beautiful. Um, personally, I think it's probably darker than it would have been historically, uh, but I can't really find a good way that I like to clean it without giving it this dark kind of I don't know, wet, wet look, you know, stained look, finished look, even though it's just oil. Um, but I think it's great. You know, I noticed something about this one. It does not even have any holes for holding a strap. So I wonder if this was a, a carried creel or maybe even a decorative piece. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, but it's really cool and I'm really happy to have it. Um, and uh, a wonderful addition to our collection. Uh, this, even though I will not be using it, is ready to be used for modern historical fishing. Thank you guys.
please follow us on Facebook if you haven't yet. If you're in Michigan, feel free to join our Michigan Historical Fishers Facebook page. And if you happen to be heading to Kalkaska, Michigan in April uh, for the National Trout Festival, we will be there with likely both our historical fishing camp and our traveling museum. And until next time, see you then.